Yes. One moment as so I get this PowerPoint up. All right. Great. And again, welcome. Thank you for being here. So some engagement guidelines I have for everyone who's attending tonight. I do ask that your mute is kept on throughout the presentation and that your video is turned off and that will help with the bandwidth for the presentation. And it'll also help prevent some distraction. And if you could view your presentation in full screen mode, that's when you're going to catch the, uh, the entirety of the show and uh, we'll really be able to glean as much from it as possible. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please do throw it into the chat. We'll have a specific Q&A session at the end. The last 10 to 15 minutes will be devoted to that. So please throw in your questions at any point that you have one and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. And most importantly, we just hope that you have a good time, that you learn something new and that you um, really walk away feeling like you, you gain quite a bit from tonight. So enjoy while you're here. And again, I wanna say thank you to our members. We have three chapters that are in Alaska. We have one out of Anchorage, one out of Southeast and Juneau. We also have kind of an unofficial designated one, but one nonetheless that has a lot of attention out of Kenai. So um, thank you all who are here, who are making these presentations free. And Alaska Wildlife Alliance has been around since the 70s, and we have three pillars that we focus our work on. We have citizen science, education, and a lot of advocacy. And there's more on our website that goes a lot more in depth into some of that work that we're doing. But um, I do want to point out that our citizen science project, we are a partner with the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, AKBMP. And if you're interested in helping beluga monitoring uh, of the critically endangered Cook Inlet belugas, that will actually be starting up pretty soon here in the spring in March. So if you are, I believe in March, I'll double check that, but um, coming up real quick. So if you're looking to help out there, you can do that. You might see us at tabling events this summer as well as some wildlife walks. And maybe you've seen our bearware posters on the electric bus system in Juneau. That's just a little bit of what we've been doing with education and outreach in addition to Wildlife Wednesdays. And we also have advocacy going on. Uh, we had a lawsuit filed in the fall to help better protect Beaufort Sea polar bears. So that's just a, a sampling, but um, much more on our website if you're interested in learning more. Some news maybe you've seen us in. Um, we have joined a group that's trying to help uh, better protect or encourage better protections for the those endangered beluga whales, as I mentioned, that are out in Cook Inlet. And we also have a board member, our vice president, who's been getting published and has been having his work featured with the world. So you can check out more on our website to read those. And also we uh, helped push forward proposal 199 to the Alaska Board of Game to ask for 50 yard trap setbacks off of popular trails in the Matsu borough up north of Anchorage. So I'm um, waiting to hear more on that, but that's just some work that you can see that we've been up to recently. Some upcoming events, we have Wildlife Wednesdays through April. We also have a climate adaptation workshop coming up in February that is free for the public. We just ask that you pre-register online and I can throw the link to that in the chat just when I am done. And so we'll be learning a lot about how wildlife managers and experts are looking to move forward and help better manage wildlife as we approach climate change in our near and current state. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in learning more, you can check out there. And then Wildlife Wednesdays, these are recorded and put online, as I mentioned, onto our Facebook page, our YouTube, and our website. And the summer we'll have wildlife walks, bears, birds, and beers. And currently we are Blue Market in Anchorage is a, a, um, a zero waste group that is an adorable market. If you haven't checked it out, you should in Anchorage, but they're donating 1% of their uh, proceeds towards the Alaska Wildlife Alliance through March. So we're really thankful for them. You should check them out. And wildlife calendars are for sale. It is still early in the year. You still have time to purchase yours. Uh, some beautiful local images of wildlife in Alaska. So you can get uh, for $15, you will have wildlife gracing your walls every day of the year. <laughs> 
And lastly, if you're looking to support Alaska Wildlife Alliance in other ways, uh, you can check out some of those little links on the bottom. Um, I'll also throw in that membership link to our website if you're interested in becoming a member with AWA. It is $35 a year, and we greatly appreciate all of our members that are part of our pack. And that's it. I'm going to toss it over to Brian for Alaska Burning on the Edge, and really excited to have you, Brian. Thank you very much, Kelsey. See if I can get uh, my screen shared without incident here. And thanks everyone for uh, joining this evening. Um, appreciate everybody coming out and, and especially appreciate um, how fortunate I have been to spend uh, the better part of 16 weeks um, in, in the great state of Alaska. You guys have uh, uh, some really special opportunities uh, there in Alaska. <clears throat> this is a king eider, and it was uh, one of the species that, that uh, drew me to, uh, to Barrow, our first destination uh, on our journey here. Uh, the map of the state shows uh, in, in red uh, the, some of the places that I've been in the state. Uh, the green line shows a road trip I did in the interior. Uh, we're not going to be covering much of that. Instead, we're going to be focused on uh, kind of the, uh, the perimeter areas of the state. So again, we're going to start off up here in Barrow. And uh, the flight to Barrow has some really, really beautiful scenery. If you can get some, uh, some clear weather, try to get some shots out the window. The, uh, the glaciers are beautiful and, and the mountains. Uh, really exciting. The flight into Barrow uh, cost, costs about $350 for the round trip from Anchorage up to Barrow. And the flight generally comes in over the Arctic Ocean. Uh, upon arriving at Barrow, you'll find that uh, the folks are friendly and uh, the snowy owls are, are welcoming here. Uh, I believe this is pronounced Poligs. Polig I can't say it, Poligsy, um, uh, which means welcome in, in the native language. Across from the airport, you'll see a signpost that uh, kind of is a little mind boggling uh, that you're closer to Paris, France than you are to uh, uh, Lake Placid, Florida uh, when you're up at Barrow. Um, so you're really, really uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere up at Point Barrow. It's a little shot from inside the King Eider Hotel where I've been staying uh, for uh, most of my visits up, uh, up to the point. Got some baleen on the wall there, uh, nicely adorned. This is a horrible photograph and, and it pains me to share it with you, but uh, it's of a spectacular bird taken out the window of, of our hotel. Uh, the day we arrived, um, one of the participants on the photo tour didn't recognize the bird and called me to his room. And, and this is actually a female ruff, a uh, real uh, rarity from Asia, uh, right outside the hotel room window. Some of the sites around town, um, whaling culture is, is uh, very steeped in the tradition uh, up at Barrow. So you'll see the whalebone arch and, and um, some seal skin boats around occasionally. The, uh, the tundra is really, really flat and not terribly attractive at, at first glance. Uh, this is a uh, Arctic fox uh, on, on the flat tundra. And it, it appears dry here, but in most areas, uh, the, the tundra is very, very wet. Um, and typically, the, the photo groups are going to spend a lot of time uh, in the waders. Uh, here's my friend George's uh, decked out in his waders, uh, waterproof gear um, when the ice fog was coming in one night. Uh, we've eaten meals in our waders. We've gone to the grocery store into our waiter, in our waders. I don't think I've slept in my waders, but pretty much everything else. The, uh, like I said, the tundra is wet and, and when things are thawing, uh, some of the roads can wash out. So you have to be mindful of, uh, of that. Uh, but on closer inspection, the tundra does have some beautiful wildflowers. This is a woolly lousewort. Uh, but back to the birds, the, um, the Again, the eiders were what really drew me to Barrow in the first place. Uh, there's, you can see all four species of eiders in, in a day at, at Barrow. This is the female and male king eider. 
And uh, this is a spectacled eider, the female. Kind of hard to identify, but you can see a little bit of the hint of that face patch uh, that gives it its uh, the, the male is much more obvious with that patch, male spectacled eider. And uh, there's also Stellar's eiders at Point Barrow, and, and they are uh, a threatened species. And uh, the, the locals are asked not to, not to hunt them. And uh, we don't want to disturb those, but they can be quite accommodating for photography. I was actually in the pond photographing uh, several species of eiders and long-tailed ducks when the Stellar's eider swam by at close range. This is a hen, the hen Stellar's on the tundra. The Stellar's is the smallest of the eiders. And uh, we'll get, we'll see a common eider in a bit. Uh, they are mainly flying by offshore in migration at Barrow. Uh, this is a, a Pacific loon. And a lot of these photographs are just in the most beautiful light. Um, it can be really, really nice from after dinner all the way up until breakfast. I've spent many nights out on the tundra um, over the midnight hour when it the light starts to dim for just a minute before it starts uh, climbing back up in the sky again. This is a greater white-fronted goose. And a uh, long-tailed duck. The long-tails have uh, some pretty neat behaviors with their, their calling and flying around. They tend to try to warn the other ducks when we're trying to approach to photograph, uh, so they can be a bit of a nuisance. They are quite beautiful. Uh, we can see both rock ptarmigan, which these are, and also uh, willow ptarmigan at, at Barrow. And the ptarmigan can be amazingly tame uh, at times. Uh, the Arctic terns are around, not in huge numbers. You probably see more of those around Anchorage. And uh, this is a, a collared lemming, which is the, the base of the food chain at, at Barrow for uh, most of the predatory uh, birds and mammals. So the snowy owls are going to feed on the lemmings, um, as are some of the Jaegers. This is a parasitic Jaeger. And uh, the, the beefy Pomeran Jaeger for sure is going to take out some of those lemmings. And uh, when the lemming population is low, then these, these predators are going to attack uh, some of the songbirds and, and shorebirds. Uh, for food. So the nesting success for those other species um, is actually better when the lemming population is, is high. Got a glaucous winged gall, another predator that's going to go after the lemmings. And uh, Sabin's gall here, just one of the most spectacularly beautiful galls with the, uh, the shape of the head and the patterns. Really a special bird. Uh, this bird is a little smaller, more dainty, and it's going to feed more on, on fish, like sticklebacks. And uh, at, at Barrow, you're pretty far north. You're as far north as you can get um, in the U.S., and there's not a whole lot of, of songbirds. This is a Lapland longspur, the common birds of the tundra, uh, savannah sparrow, and and snow bunting. Uh, these are the, the three more common uh, songbirds that you might run into uh, at Barrow. A good time to visit Barrow is in, uh, in June, uh, usually around the second or third week is the most popular time to visit. And even though I went up there for eiders, I, I fell in love with the shorebirds and, and the shorebird behavior. This is the semi-palmated sandpiper. And these guys get there just as early as they can, sometimes, uh, at great risk when the tundra hasn't thawed yet. Uh, but soon they commence to displaying to attract a mate. Uh, the dumlins do a, a wing display and call for uh, to, to their mates. This is a white rump sandpiper, which is a, a pretty rare bird pretty much everywhere. Uh, they are up at, at Barrow in small numbers and, and they elicit some wing display behaviors. The, uh, this is an American golden plover, and they do some interesting behaviors as well, including marching down a territorial boundary uh, adjacent to uh, you know, a rival male. Uh, they will, they'll do um, boundary uh, flights as well. This is part of a boundary flight that this bird is doing. Red phalarope is maybe one of the most common birds 
at Barrow. Um, they're, they're found in every roadside puddle, ditch, um, any, any place there's water, they're all over the place and just spectacularly beautiful. Uh, the other fowl rope that's there is the red-necked fowl rope. These birds are well known for their spin feeding. And the buff-breasted sandpiper is a, a lovely little shorebird that anybody would be fortunate enough to see. Um, and especially fortunate to see them engaged in some of their uh, breeding behaviors. This is the, uh, the embrace display where the females are coming in to check out the underwing linings on the buff breasted or on the male buff, buff breasted. Uh, these are long billed dowagers, and they were involved in a display that I couldn't wait to read about. Um, and I got home and I could not find a single thing in the literature about the, the display that I observed. Uh, one bird would pick up a little twig and hold it and drop it and kind of step back and kind of dare another bird to try to take it. And then there would be this battle of wing beating and chasing and biting belly feathers, et cetera. And uh, the chase was on. And then a third bird would go pick up the stick. Uh, and it would just, uh, just kind of kept continuing um, repeated action over and over. It was really, really cool display to see. And I have no idea what it was about. Certainly uh, some pair bonding going on uh, because the next day the, the birds were all paired and not in a flock anymore. But uh, you know why, why the little willow twig was so important, who knows. Uh, the pectoral sandpiper is another great bird of the, of the tundra. Kind of a boring bird in migration, but when they get up north, they, they puff out their chest and they do a, a display flight with their chest puffed. Really hard to capture these small birds in, in flight. And um, as they're doing this chef, uh, puffed up chest routine, they're flying over top of, uh, over a female and, and calling a uh, really weird sound. I'm gonna embarrass myself here and try to imitate it. It was kind of like and I didn't know what it was the first time I heard it, so I was kind of freaked out. Um, here's the uh, pectoral uh, with his chest really, really stretched out here. And if you look closely, he's trying to win the attention of this female that's tucked down into the grasses here. Uh, we get some uh, rare uh, Asian shorebirds at Barrow. This is a redneck stent. And then this is the, uh, the male ruff, um, much more attractive than the, than the female that was hiding out in the water behind the hotel. Um, this, they have a hard time, I think, finding each other to, to breed. This, this male was uh, displaying to a, uh, to a female pectoral sandpiper, much to the chagrin of, of the male. So everything so far at, at Barrow here has been from June. Um, I went in October in the hopes of seeing Ross's gall. And I uh, did see one bird on, on the first day, which was really, really exciting. But then amazingly, uh, we had 700 Ross's gall, uh, galls on the, on the second day. And some of the birds show this really blushy, peachy uh, belly uh, that you can see in this bird here. Just really, really beautiful species. So we didn't think it could get any better than seeing 700 Ross's galls. Uh, but promptly we turned around and found a song thrush. And most people probably haven't heard of a song thrush, but um, this was the first um, US record for this species and only the second record ever for the species in North America. Uh, this is a bird of, uh, of Asia in Mongolia is kind of the center of its breeding uh, territory. So that was pretty cool. And on that uh, fall trip, then we also got to experience um, the bowhead whale harvest, which turned into an instant festival in town. Um, it's very important um, to the to the history of the of the native people there, and um, just it was really cool to see the town come together to help with the processing of uh, of the bowhead. Very, very, it was sad and emotional to me, but it was also very cool to see how important it was to, to the locals there. Uh, this is a, about a 60 foot uh, whale. 
and uh, not considered uh, an especially large one. And this uh, close-up shows that they would move move the whale with these big forklifts. So we've got one fork here on the on the head. There's a second fork over here picking up the the rest of the whale. I can't even imagine a, a really large one. <clears throat> No trip to Barrow is complete without a, uh, a drive out the pea gravel uh, to the point. And here you can see you're closing in on the point with the ocean on both sides. It does take a pretty substantial vehicle to be able to get there. So uh, I don't recommend taking the rental car. Uh, try to hire a local person to take you out there. It's a motley crew right there at the tip. Uh, but from Barrow on uh, one of my visits to Barrow, I, I went to Prudhoe Bay, uh, and then on to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge at Kaktovik. And this is a map of the, of the refuge as seen uh, up here in the northeast part of the state. And south, it's, uh, the refuge is about the size of South Carolina. Um, and our first camp, uh, both of our camps were about 70 miles from, from, the nearest, um, from the nearest village. This is Kaktovik where the flight comes in. And we mentioned the other eiders earlier. This is the common eider, and uh, it was much more, um, well, common at, uh, at Kaktovik. Uh, we would see them at Barrow, but they were usually flying by far out uh, on the ocean. We got some close-up views of, of them at, uh, at Kaktovik. Uh, the sun doesn't set in June, so uh, the kids are out playing in the street at, at uh, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, having fun. This is a view from the back seat of the little um, um, Tundra plane that we use to fly into our camp. And a view out the window of the braided Canning River. And uh, this is the, the Polygon Tundra. Um, the Polygon has many, many different names uh, given uh, by, the, by the native uh, folks. And it can be either wet or dry, depending on the on the shape of of the tundra and whether it's uh, dipped down or raised up. This is more of a dry tundra, and you can see millennia of um, caribou have created these tracks in the tundra. They kind of look like vehicle tracks, but but those are uh, our caribou track. Here's our our bush plane taking us to to Camp One here. Uh, the American Tourister luggage is probably not the best uh, luggage to take to, to the National Wildlife Refuge. A backpack might be preferred. Uh, this is our, our camp uh, with the, uh, the cooking tent. The, the sleeping tents are way up here away from the, uh, the cooking tent. Uh, we had caribou come right through uh, camp at times and we shared space with the Arctic ground squirrels. And uh, exploring around camp, we found uh, American golden plover and uh, found this nest of well camouflaged eggs that belong to the plover. And uh, the reason we picked this particular camp is we wanted to try to see a uh, yellow billed loon. So we got, uh, got to see the yellow billed loon at a lake after a, about a mile and a half hike from camp. And on the way back, I noticed this pile of cigarette butts, or so I thought initially. Um, and I, was, I couldn't imagine who would stand around smoking uh, cigarettes. And the closer inspection, uh, I realized that it was uh, ptarmigan droppings. And there were willow ptarmigan around. And then we moved from camp one to, um, to our second camp, another shot of the, uh, of the Canning River. And we couldn't get into where we wanted to land originally because the, uh, the shorebird study team had, had tore up the runway coming in with all their supplies uh, the day before. Uh, so we landed elsewhere, kind of a beautiful uh, view of the Brooks Range from, from Camp 2. And it is a bit, it's a bit uh, nerve wracking not being at the top of the food chain. I'm not sure if these are grizzly tracks or polar bear tracks, but um, they, they were big and they were right outside of our camp. But our camp too was, was uh, the spot where we really hoped to photograph um, some more shorebirds. This is a stilt sandpiper. 
And uh, we did get into uh, some buff breasted sandpipers uh, then and, and some, some display as well. You'll notice how, what a great job these birds uh, do with, with their camouflage pattern uh, of their plumage. They just always seem to blend in with, with the habitat that they prefer. This is a male buff breasted trying to gain the attention of a female that's completely ignoring him. They do single wing and double wing uh, displays, and uh, they will actually display at uh, towards people. Uh, a, a friend of mine had had told me that, and I kind of discarded it. I didn't think anything else about it until I kept having to back up because this bird was coming closer and closer to me as I was photographing. So it was a wonderful experience with the with the buff breasteds on the uh, tundra of the National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the birds did not uh, display except for that first evening, but this uh, bruiser of a parasitic Jaeger was hanging, hanging out, and I just think they didn't want to uh, draw attention to themselves. I photographed this, uh, this Jaeger basically from my tent. Back to Kaktovic, waiting on the plane out of town, someone came into the hotel and, and said there's a grizzly bear down uh, by, the, uh, by the boneyard, uh, so this is a carcass. Uh, of a bowhead whale and we bartered with with someone to get a, a pickup truck so we could go down and, and see the polar bear so i was so amped up and and so excited the uh the first uh 20 shots or so i took were were really quite blurry um, i must have sound quite quite embarrassed but uh, fortunately some of them came out uh so from, uh, from Pruto, we're going to go over to uh, Nome out on the Seward Peninsula. Uh, this is another uh, flight that's about 350 bucks uh, right now for the round trip from, from Anchorage. Uh, sometimes the flight actually goes through Cotsview, so you can, you can dip above the, uh, the Arctic Circle um, on your way out to Nome. And at Nome, we have a lot more uh, ground to cover. The, the roads here go about 70 miles in, in three different directions. So lots of ground to cover, a lot more species uh, being further south, the diversity is better. And uh, all the roads eventually uh, lead out into the mountains, um, whereas Nome itself is, is coastal and uh, fairly flat right, right, at the, right at coast, but uh, definitely get up into the, into the mountains. Uh, the weather here is, is going to be a little warmer at, at Nome than, than at Barrow. Uh, highs can be in the 70s, even 80s, but it still can dip down and get quite cold. Uh, Nome has a long history of, of gold mining. Uh, so this is a, uh, a sluice box, uh, I guess, a, a giant one. And most of the gold mining today is done actually uh, with a vacuum uh, sucking up uh, debris off the, uh, the floor of the Bering Sea, just, uh, just off the shore from town. And this is the, t the uh, train to nowhere, which was built to uh, haul some of the uh, valuable resources um, from Nome, but the, the tracks were never completed and the project was abandoned. Here's uh, Hoda, one of my clients, dressed for the dressed for the weather, getting low, trying to photograph some birds. As I said, uh, it can get cold and and uh, you know, quite chilly with with snow even in in June at at uh, at Nome. But it, it's more often than not, it doesn't get that that cold. That's that was a kind of a rare thing for us. It was cool to see the uh, the muskox in in the falling snow. See more mammals at at uh, Nome as well. The muskox. Here's a couple of a uh, couple of young uh, calf moose. And this red fox. You can see the egg in the mouth, but if you look more closely, uh, there's also several chicks um, hanging from the mouth as well. And uh, I didn't know what these were at first until the short-eared owl started dive bombing and harassing and, and trying to chase that fox off. So he got a, a nice big, uh, big meal there. 
One of the roads goes right past a, uh, a, a cliff nest that uh, sometimes is used by golden eagles. And uh, the, the male is very captivating here with that gold nape and everything, but some folks don't notice that there's this little chick in the frame on the right. So we saw parasitic and Pomeran Jaegers up at Barrow. Uh, Long-tailed Jaegers are uh, more common down at, at Nome and uh, they can be very aggressive if you're walking across the tundra and, and wander uh, close to a nest, they, they will dive bomb you as will the, the Arctic terns. And if you happen to have a short lens, um, when, they, when they get after you, you might be able to get some close-up shots. We saw the Pacific loon at, uh, at Barrow. This is a red-throated loon. It's uh, much more common at, uh, at Nome. It does occur at Barrow, but it's uh, easier to photograph at Nome. And red neck grebes. Uh, these occur in Anchorage also, uh, some of the ponds and parks in town. The tundra at Nome is quite beautiful. There's a, a lot of wonderful wildflowers. Uh, these are rhododendron with an American pipit and uh, Lapland longspur in, in the cotton grass. A semi palmated uh, plover also in the, uh, in the rhododendron. There's a number of plover species at, uh, at Barrow. So you've got the semi-palmated, uh, we've got a black-bellied plover, and the American golden plover, which we saw up at uh, Barrow and um, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And then another bird that looks a, quite a bit like the American golden plover, but this is the uh, Pacific golden plover. Uh, the main difference is the, the amount of white uh, showing on uh, this edge underneath the, the wing there. Western sandpiper is, is wildly abundant on the tundra at Nome. Uh, they can be all over the place. I've, I've found many nests. I've seen chicks that had just hatched. Um, this chick is probably uh, no more than a couple of days old. Um, just really, really special and, and how beautiful the tundra is. Um, some of the most fun of my life photographing uh, the Western sandpiper chicks. The red knot's a declining species, uh, but they do breed up at, at Nome. Beautiful bird. And uh, Wimbrel is quite common uh, at Nome as well. Some of these birds are taking on just magnificent migrations that we don't have time to go into, into great detail on, but uh, Wimbrel will fly right through the eye of a hurricane uh, in their migration at times. And uh, this is a bar-tailed godwit. Um, just does some really spectacular long distance migrations. Uh, they, they stage uh, in southeastern Alaska and they can fly, um, you know, close to 12,000 kilometers all the way to New Zealand. And now this is a nonstop flight uh, that, that takes eight days. Um, so really just an amazing feat. I get winded going to the mailbox. So <laughs> I'm really impressed by these birds. Uh, some of the other birds that uh, Nome are, are the, um, I'm drawing a blank on this bird for some reason. Um, I'll think of it. And a, a golden crowned sparrow. An orange crowned warbler. And then we get a, a number of species that are uh, actually Asian species spilling over. Um, and, and breeding at Nome or, or straying there in migration. So this is an Arctic warbler and a, a blue throat. Got a yellow wagtail and uh, the Aleutian tern. And I was really surprised to find this Mongolian plover uh, really hard to get close to, to try to get a decent photograph of this bird, but a uh, super rarity and happy, happy to find it. Uh, so we're going to go on out to the uh, Aleutian Islands and uh, into the Pribilof Islands next. Uh, this is a much more expensive flight. Uh, take, it's about a thousand dollars round trip to Dutch Harbor. And um, then from Dutch Harbor, there is now a flight with Grant Aviation where you can get directly to, uh, to St. George. 
that one's only about 125 and then St. George to St. Paul's only about uh, 25 bucks. Um, it's a real bargain, actually. <laughs> so Pinair provides the service out to, um, out to uh, Dutch, uh, at least they used to. Uh, that airline's been in and out of bankruptcy. I'm not sure the status currently. Uh, on Alaska and the port of Dutch Harbor is the, uh, the busiest fishing port in, in the U.S. You're actually about as far, you're, you're even, uh, you're further west than Hawaii uh, out there at, at Dutch Harbor on the, on the islands. The fishing vessel here, and they do a lot of crabbing as well. And if, if there's any stray uh, songbirds from, from Asia that that show up on these little islands, a lot of times they can be found in amongst the, uh, the crab pots, a good place to look for rare birds. Uh, the Grand Aleutian Hotel is, is about the only option for lodging at Dutch Harbor. Uh, it's pricey, but it is a beautiful hotel and uh, the sleeping is good, except when a, a drunk fisherman pulls the fire alarm. True story. Here's my friend, George. Um, big snowfall that takes a long time to melt off. And again, these are our June visits. The main reason to go to, to Dutch Harbor uh, birding wise would be to, uh, to get out to the baby islands uh, to see whiskered auklet and some other seabirds. Uh, we had a lot of wind, a lot of rain, a lot of delayed boat trips. Um, so it was good to have some other things to photograph around town. The scenery was quite beautiful. An old Russian Orthodox church here overlooking the bay. This is an interesting sign you don't see everywhere. Danger, beware of nesting eagles at the post office. Uh, but the eagles are a real draw uh, at Dutch Harbor. They can be quite tame and uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of them. Uh, so some, some good bald eagle uh, photo ops. Harlequin ducks are, are uh, abundant in uh, in the harbor. Uh, I observed a bald eagle actually dive bombing trying to catch one and the harlequin duck just was flying and it just it entered the water at full speed at what must have been 60 miles per hour. I don't know how it didn't break its neck uh, but it did escape. I uh, got a rosy finch, one of the common songbirds at uh, Dutch Harbor and rock ptarmigan. Uh, in a little bit different plumage than we saw before, right? Uh, we saw the white uh, plumaged rock ptarmigan. Uh, this one's a little later into the season and it is um, molted out of most of the white plumage. It's a lot of melt and, and runoff from the, uh, from the snowpack um, into these streams, providing great habitat for an American dipper actually waded through a, a rushing stream to, uh, to get in position for this shot. And we're still waiting on the, on the boat trip to see the seabirds. So we photographed some flowers, uh, lupin and the uh, spotted lady slipper, uh, very unique, um, very uni unique uh, orchid found out at Dutch Harbor. <clears throat> The sea otters were a lot of fun to uh, photograph and, and the red fox. But finally, we're gonna get into some seabird action here. This is a pigeon guillemot actually nesting um, in, a, in a little uh, porthole in the, the side of this old, uh, old boat. And from the boat, we photographed the uh, surf birds, which were just incredibly camouflaged when they were actually up against uh, the habitat that you're seeing here. This one's kind of isolated, but uh, you could hardly, could hardly see the birds. Uh, black oyster catchers were common out on the water, um, hopping from rock to rock and flying around. Uh, and this is a uh, Cassin's auklet, uh, one, a very small auklet out on the water. And we're getting closer to the baby islands now, uh, getting, in, getting into some ancient merlets. Pretty cool seabird, but the uh, the grand prize. This was one of the probably the one of the more difficult birds to find and, and see in in the U.S. Uh, it's a, a whiskered auklet, nice little flock of them. They have these nice long plumes arching out from their foreheads and then also uh, extending from their from their bill and from their uh, eyes. 
pretty cool bird. And if you put out some chum, you may get into um, a big flock of northern fulmars, which may attract uh, the Lazen's albatross, the larger bird in the middle. Black-footed albatross will also come in uh, for the chum. This one's kind of doing his water ski routine. And a close-up of the, just the magnificent Lazen's albatross. I could do a whole program just on, on this bird. Uh, they're so fantastic. <clears throat> Uh, so again, finally, we make, uh, made it from Dutch Harbor to St. George. We had some serious delays due to uh, ash plumes where the uh, pilot couldn't go over, under, or around. Uh, but we made it to uh, St. George eventually uh, through Grant Aviation. And the cliffs at St. George are, are spectacular. It's a younger island that hasn't eroded as much. Uh, so beautiful cliffs, lots of nesting space for the seabirds. And uh, when you have seabirds with uh, vulnerable nests with eggs and chicks, you'll have some fox. Got a thick-billed myrrh here. And a parakeet auklet. I got low to uh, get some out-of-focus flowers in the foreground. Otherwise, uh, things kind of lack color with the gray ocean and the, and the uh, black and white bird. This is a least auklet. They look perpetually surprised with their big wide eyes and, and they just always look a little startled to me. Uh, Red-faced cormorant here. And uh, this is a fur seal. So pretty cool to see those guys up close. And St. George and St. Paul Islands on the Pribilofs are one of the few places uh, where you'd have a chance at seeing a uh, red-legged kittiwake. So another, uh, another really rare bird that's, that's hard to find outside of, uh, outside of the pribs. <clears throat> the rock sandpipers, uh, are, they're pretty boring in playing actually in, uh, in non-breeding plumage at, where we see them in, in the winter in California, uh, but quite spectacular in and amongst the flowers uh, during, during the breeding season. This is a, um, not a parakeet auklet, I'm just drawing a blank again, um, crested auklet. The crests are a little hidden there, um, hidden in amongst the rocks. And uh, the puffins, the puffins are the real treat of, of the Pribilof Islands uh, for me, the horned puffin uh, flying into the burrows and uh, the tufted puffins hanging out on the rocks. I was fortunate to get a number of puffin images uh, published by Birds and Blooms magazine uh, not, too, not too long ago. And uh, we'll conclude with this close-up of a tufted puffin uh, that I photographed by uh, crawling into the opening of a, of a fox den. And he, he had a second tunnel that went out onto the cliffs. And by laying in that opening, I could uh, get a, a close-up portrait of a puffin that was just on the other side of, of the uh, of the den opening there. And with that, I hope I didn't go too long, uh, but I think we can open, open up for uh, questions. Brian, I just wanna say thank you and that those, your photographs are stunning. I wanted to comment. <laughs> Earlier on, I was like typing out comments to throw into the chat, but every single photo I had something to say about it. And so thank you very much for sharing all those. I'm just blown away. I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. Um, if anyone has questions, now would be a good time to throw them into the chat. And we will start with one. Um, first one I, I threw in, I wanted to know what has been your favorite bird to photograph amongst all this? Oh my gosh, that is so hard. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I really, as I said in the program, I, I, I went to Barrow seeking out the eiders for sure. And, and you know, the spectacled and the stellars are more rare, but the king eider is just such a magnificent bird. Um, really, really special. So a favorite bird might, might be king eider. Um, but the more I go there and the more I see different shorebird behaviors as part of the trip, like that's what really keeps me engaged with going back over and over and over again. 
Um, so Bar Barrow is a really special place. Um, I'm going to go King Eider, though. Oh, that's amazing. They're stunning. Um, is there a species that you have been wanting to capture that has eluded you? <laughs> that Ross's gall was was the bird, right? Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I went all the way to Barrow in October, for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> the one um, that got away. <laughs> get that bird. So... Um, that one was definitely really high on the priority list. Um, gosh, I don't know. I'm sure there's one out there. I'll, I'll try to think about that. Uh, all right. So we have someone who asked, can you tell us more about albatross that are in the Dutch Harbor area? Yeah, so there's uh, there's the black-footed albatross and the laysons albatross, and there's all there's a third species uh, that I have not seen, and I'm going to probably blank on that one too because I haven't seen it. Um, but the uh, the laysons albatross uh, just really a spectacular bird if you think about how far they fly, um, how far they fly without ever flapping a wing. Uh, their their life uh, expectancy. There's a um, there's an albatross uh, named Wisdom that is uh, currently I think she is now 69 or 70 years old and um, has returned um, to her nesting grounds uh, yet again. I don't know how many chicks she's raised, um, but if you think about a bird that 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 is that long lived. They've actually radio tracked um, Laysan's albatross for an entire year. And I, I don't remember the mileage, but if you, if you multiply that out by their life expectancy, um, these birds could do eight round trips to the moon in their lifetime. Round trips, <laughs> it's just like <laughs> mind blown, right? Again, when did going to the mailbox? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so just really, really cool stuff um, with these birds, and and you know, it's it's so sad to see what plastics are doing to them. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of the images of the of you know a bird that's that's died and, and decomposed, and then there's just this pile of plastic where their intestines were. Um, it's just just gut wrenching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. Um... Have, AWA has some albatross bolus for dissections and just there's marine debris and boluses. It's, it's almost impossible not to have these boluses, which are albatross boluses are like regurgitated. It's like an owl pellet, whatever can't be digested from the albatross and the babies will regurgitate just trash. And it's just, uh, lighters it's, and bottle caps and yeah and like toothbrushes big items <laughs> that you wouldn't think and they just look so tasty and but to think that they're going on such migrations as far away distances including to alaska where they're feeding is just oh it's, it's heart-wrenching they're not dynamic soaring is is spectacular too uh they're they, they have super long wings and and the wings actually do this kind of trifold thing to be able to uh, tuck up against their body and if the wind's strong all they really have to do is just lift them out and they just they pop up off the water um and and they soar up on the wind and then they dive for speed and they ride that wind that's on the front edge of a wave and and then lift up again it's and they don't flap a, they don't flap at all um for hours and hours and, and probably days at a time very cool yeah, incredible. The, the things we could learn and take from that in a human's world. Um, someone else asked, let's see here, regarding travel delays, are there any long delays in these remote locations? Or did you encounter any long delays in those remote locations? I've really, for the most part, been been super fortunate to, to not encounter delays. Um, this actually, uh, last June, on the flight from Anchorage to uh, Barrow, this and this had never happened to me before. Got all the way up there, the plane is dropping in for the landing, and at some whatever elevation, if they can't see the runway, they pull up and and circle and try again. 
and uh, we we did a little circling and waiting on the you know the air, the weather report from air traffic control, and um, eventually we flew all the way back to Anchorage and never landed at, at Barrow, and had to try again the next day uh, to get in. So there was that one, but but the really the epic one was um, the trip out to Dutch Harbor and then on to the Pribilof. So we've. We had a flight from Anchorage that was, we taxied out to the runway twice, twice we went back. Um, they were trying to service the um, hydraulics, which are apparently important for flying and landing. I don't know. Um, the Wright brothers didn't have hydraulics, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I went back to the airport super early the next morning and good luck finding lodging under a million dollars in, in June at, at the last second. Um, so I went to the airport super early and, and got us all rebooked. Um, one of the participants got left behind at the airport because they double booked his seat. And uh, then we made it out to Dutch Harbor. We had the fire alarm incident out there. And um, we were actually delayed for multiple days due to a massive uh, ash plume from a volcano. And uh, what's really cool is these small airports, you know, you're not talking to somebody at, at a desk that's just being fed information. You're talking to the actual pilots that, that, that's going to fly you. And um, he said, basically, you know, we, we can't go that high to go over it. And the plume's all the way down to the deck, so we can't go under it. We don't have a snorkel. Um, and it was too long and wide to, to go around because he couldn't carry enough fuel. Uh, so we just kind of had to keep waiting and go photograph something, then come back to the airport and check and see what, what the update is. Um, so lots of delays on that trip. Then um, we did make it to St. George finally, and we should, we would have like landed and then took off the next day for St. Paul because of all the delays. But then we got fog delayed at St. George. So we did get an extra day there. And the flight from St. George got delayed too. So we were able to uh, spend a, uh, from uh, not St. George, St. Paul got delayed as well. So we got to spend a little bit of time on St. Paul, which was some of the best photography of, of the entire trip. So it all worked out in the end. Lots of challenges, lots of uh, just being flexible and, and know that um, life is on what I call tundra time in Alaska. No one has any sense of urgency in these uh, outlying areas because they've just gotten used to, um, you just kind of have to go with the flow. Someone commented, the, the joys of traveling in the Aleutians. <laughs> 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 Seems like a common occurrence. You just have to be flexible, like you said, going with the flow. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I, I picked the perfect group for it too. They were totally chill and down for whatever. So it, it was great. Can make it, it changes it entirely if you're with some people who can just make it a memorable experience in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have another question here. You talked about the abundance of Harlequin ducks in Dutch Harbor. Are there any other, other instances of very high density that were memorable? Um, well, just the, the seabirds in general, um, I'm going to try to remember some numbers here for you, but um, oh boy, it's been a long time. St. Paul is, is actually a much older island than St. George, so the cliffs uh, in general aren't as uh, magnificent and, and tall. They don't tend to hold as many birds, but I want to say... Um, St. Paul had, at one point, uh, a study I was reading, had 750,000 nesting seabirds, and uh, St. George actually has 10 times that many. I, I think it's 750 and 7.5 million. I, I could, be, could be wrong on that one. But yeah, so the, 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 the biomass, right, that's always fantastic when you've got just huge, huge concentrations of, of birds. Love that. It's hard to even picture in your head what that would look like. <laughs> Cloud. <laughs> Clouds of birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we have one last question just wrapping up before we're going to end for this evening. Um, someone asked, do you know of any sites to submit photos of birds to possibly get published? Uh, sites? I mean, 
there's a, there's a lot of folks that are just giving their stuff away. So it's getting harder and harder to get paid to get published. Um, it's making it really tough on, on the professionals. Um, I, I do get um, some things published and, and paid, but the, the, the tours are, are a lot more fun than submitting images and, and uh, you know, leading trips, meeting people. And, and um, but as far as sites, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, there's lots of sites where you can share your images and, and I guess they're published in that way on, online, right? Um, but in, in print, um, you know, I get, I get a lot of contacts, you know, can I use your work for free? And I have a hard time with that because I spend a lot of time, effort, money on equipment, money on travel. And my response is usually, well, are you getting paid to your, do your job? <laughs> then, then why shouldn't I get paid to do mine? Yeah, no, that's fair. It's a, it's an industry industry and, um, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and someone made a comment, any options for getting out to the west side of Nunavak? Am I even saying that? It, it kind of in response to that site to submit photos of birds. Um, the west side of Nunavik. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked at that one yet. Okay. Yeah, just wanted to loop that in. That was kind of response to that but yeah, I've not been up to um to gamble uh to uh that's like a really popular place for like really rare birds from Asia uh that get lost in migration so I've not been up in there gotcha well it is eight o'clock on the dot in Alaska time but it is midnight Brian's time so <laughs> I want to be respectful of, of your time, Brian, uh, thank you for being here as late as it is over for over by you. Um, but thank you, these photographs are just breathtaking. It's such, just incredible. I could talk for so long and ask so many questions about every single one that you shared. So thank you, it makes me wanna travel to faraway places. <laughs> um, yeah. If you- to share my email address if anyone has any, uh, yeah. uh, any additional questions or uh, anything. I'll take all the comments about the beautiful pictures too. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, if yeah, you can provide your email and then people can uh, reach out to you that way. And also on social media, the Saber Wings you said has Facebook and Instagram, right? Yeah, uh, the, the easiest way to find us is probably through uh, social media, Saber Wing Nature Tours and uh, our email addresses is readily available through there. Yeah, okay, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm going to end this recording for the evening. Awesome.